Please give a very, very warm welcome to Joseph Kudelka. And I could not be more excited uh, to have this conversation because we talked about unrealized projects earlier and it has been for many, many years one of my unrealized projects to have a conversation. So before we start, another very, very big round of applause and welcome for the amazing Joseph Kudelka. <laughs> and I wanted to begin with the beginning as it, we did with Ming Smith and ask you how it all began, how you came to photography. Thank you. How you came to photography or how photography came to you? First of all, thank you for coming and good evening. I really don't, one is making mistakes all the time and I think I made a mistake that I accepted to come here. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I even, uh, there were a few people who came to me and they said, what is the su subject of your speech? Uh, I never giving any speech. <coughs> and uh, I, uh, <coughs> I am I am ready to answer anything what you what any question which you put me. But um I would like to give you warning. Don't take me seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just this little joke. <laughs> yeah. And <coughs> I uh, uh I consider myself that I'm trying to be a photographer and not a speaker, and I have been doing photography for a certain time. Still, I don't know much about it, and I'm still learning. <coughs> anyway, so thank you for coming, and I'm ready to answer. Your question was when I first came to the photography. Yeah, how it all began, yeah. yeah. Um, one of my <coughs> uh, grandfather, uh, which my family used to come to see him every week to the other village. Um, there were the, <coughs> I think it must have been either print or photography. It was, what was on the picture is fascinating me. I think it must have been uh, <coughs> Bay in Naples. And there were the blue water and I never saw blue water in my life. So I couldn't imagine that something like that exists. What was interesting also, that this picture has got panoramic format. And uh, what would you say is the beginning of your catalog resume? What's the first photograph you would say is a photo you are happy with? The first photograph in your oeuvre catalog? I don't think I have any any uh, catalog raison. Uh, I uh, put me a different way the question. So then maybe what were the inspirations when you began? What inspired you at the beginning of your work? I was born in a little village, uh, 500 people living there. And once a week, they came the baker <coughs> with bread. It was this dark bread which lasts for one week. He was a friend of my father, and he brought with him <coughs> some of his photographs. They were the photograph of the landscape. And I really like to have a look on this photograph. So <coughs> I started to feel that I should uh, have photographic camera and try. So I must have been uh, maybe eight or ten. And so I went to forest and, and I collected the, the, the wild strawberries and which every week I went to sell them to local uh, uh, I, person who made the ice cream. Uh, when I <coughs> succeed to have enough money, I bought 
<laughs> camera, which was the completely cheapest one, which anybody could buy. You really, uh, uh, there was nothing what you should arrange. Uh, and I have got a lot of problems with this camera, it didn't work, but um, that was my first camera. And you started photography capturing familial, familial surroundings, uh, and then of course there are these experiments from 62. And the other day I visited uh, Pierre Soulard, who is now 100 years old. He turns 100 and uh, or turned 100 years old and, you know, in set. And he told me that he wrote the text about these experiments, which fascinated him a lot, from 62. Can you tell us about what you did there with the camera? So I think <coughs> if you buy camera, uh, you are trying to discover what camera is able to do. And uh, <coughs> in fact, this, my second camera was Rolay Flex 6x6. And <coughs> I bought it, and they have got some um, something which you put on, uh, on the lenses so that you can photograph pretty close. Um, I like this idea. I started photograph. Uh, uh, a lot of things with this camera. It was beginning of uh, the experiments. I then I have this little exhibition in 1961 where I show some of these <coughs> pictures. They were the graphic designer uh, of theater magazine, and he liked them, so he asked me, strangely enough, if I can do a series of the photographs similar like that, and he wanted to use them uh, on the cover of the magazine. It was very strange for me that um, uh, the magazine was monthly about photography, and he wanted to use pictures like that. So just I tried, again, I, as I tried to do, discover what camera can do, I tried to discover what I can do with the film. So this is part of my experiments, um, which I was really trying to figure out of what film is able to do. Now the other thing which is at the beginning very important is theater, and you uh, actually worked for a leading, uh, a with, you worked with leading Czech theater companies. And uh, it's interesting because I was very close friends with Agnes Varda, whom I would like to remember here tonight, the amazing Agnes Varda, and she always told me that she actually began her trajectory um, by making photographs of uh, theater, really, in Avignon. The experiments at the time of the theater festival in Avignon, and through that she came to photography and then later to, to film. And so it's interesting that you also had this very early work with theater. Can you tell us about that? <coughs> I made this first exhibition uh, when I was still a student. It was 1961. And um, <coughs> my friend from the university told me, listen, uh, my <coughs> uncle is working for the magazine, a theater magazine, and uh, trying to find the photographer. And uh, maybe you should go there. So I went there, and they sent me to photograph Mother Courage. So they were my first pictures, and um, <coughs> gradually I get much more involved with the theater photography, and uh, I, uh, there was a new uh, company which started, and uh, the man who started this company was Otto Mark Recha. He approached me, uh, if I, uh, he, he saw my, my pictures, being published, and he approached me if I want to work with, with the comp company. I, uh, uh, because before I was doing the, I was taking pictures only from the auditorium, um, I, uh, <coughs> I said yes, I would like to do, but I would like to be able I put him three conditions. Uh, first of the was that I want to photograph at least three general um, general performance that I can then that I can walk between the actors. You can, I I really I wanted photograph the photo uh, theater 
as a, as a life. The one thing which I realized immediately that I really don't want to document <coughs> theater. I, I was really not interested in documenting. I'm still not interested in documenting. And that only way what I can do, just take it, take <coughs> the theater as a reality and try to make something else out of it. Um, I, I am preparing the book on my theater, uh, theater exhibition, which I'm working with somebody in Prague to do it. Now you said that before, and it's really interesting about it not being, it never being documentation. You basically create some other reality. Um, uh, how, can you tell us a little bit about about that? Because I think it's fascinating that it's not documentation, but you kind of followed and uh, you know photographed these theater performances, but you produced other reality. I think probably <coughs> it might be possible to say generally. Uh, <coughs> There are all these categories about documentary photographer, and uh, <clears throat> I don't uh, recognize any of these categories. I consider myself that I really, in all my work, I use the reality, but I am not documenting it. I am just picking up from the reality what I am interested in. With the gypsies, it was similar. Gypsies. <laughs> which probably you saw uh, in my book, gypsies are not like that. Gypsies are also like that. Now that actually uh, brings us, of course, right away to my next question, which is to ask you about this extraordinary gypsy work book. It's actually not one book, as I found out today. It's three books. <coughs> yes, when I was in Czechoslovakia, <coughs> I worked with the local <coughs> graphist from whom I learned a lot of things. And we made a dummy of the book, which should, which should came out in 1968. Uh, you know that 1968, the Russian came to Czechoslovakia, and I photographed the invasion. And Finally, I needed to leave Czechoslovakia because even that my pictures were published uh, as an anonymous Prague photographer, uh, I uh, police could find very easily who the Prague photographer is. So finally, I succeed uh, <coughs> to get out. Um, how, how was the question exactly? Yeah, the question was about uh, the, the gypsy work, the exonerary work, yeah, and so how you yeah. did three, so, so, three books. So there were the dummy, which I prepared in Czechoslovakia, and which was the dummy was done similar way, uh, like the, uh, the last book which you know, which means there were the structure of the book was that Horizontal picture were double page. I was mainly using the camera 25 millimeter lens, 35 millimeter lens, and vertical pictures were vertical. I compose it this way that if you look even on the two vertical pictures that you still, you look at it as a one, one double page. So I did the dummy of this book. Um, the, uh, the strange story of this dummy, this dummy came uh, to um, Paris office. They sent it to New York. Life magazine got very excited about this. Um, I still I was in Czechoslovakia. Then I come back, and dummy n never came back to Paris. They, they, I was told that they sent it uh, to uh, New York sent it to Paris, but it was never sent, and, and I discovered, I never discovered it. Of course, I succeeded to make the other dummy, which I have been looking all the time through. This dummy, which I <coughs> made, I show when I came to <coughs> on the West to Robert Delpierre, and he said that he wanted to do the 
book different way. It was the period when he they, uh, when he made Americans uh, or Germans, so it was one page uh, uh, and not one picture and nothing on the left side. Um, we work on the dummy of this book about three years. Finally, it was published by Aperture in 1975. Some of you know it. Then I still, I never forget about this original conception. And so I decided to eventually to do the sec the, the, the other version. Of course, not exactly like I did in Czechoslovakia. I extended it for, uh, some photographs, and <coughs> but the structure was very similar. I um, Delpir book, I think it was which we which we work for a long time on the sequencing and selection, was more or less every picture hit. The second book, um, I wanted to do something different. I uh, people are. People often they put me the question of which book I prefer. Um, for me, <coughs> I um, these books are different, and <coughs> the second book is much more, as I think, about the generally about the life of certain group of the people. I think I use the gypsies <coughs> for some sort of generalization. I think John Sharkovsky in that time, he made nice quotation about, about that. In this time, I, uh, there is uh, even here on the stand of Aperture and uh, uh, Delpier, there is the new book, which is, which costs 20, uh, 24 euros, and <coughs> it is uh, the third version of the book. Third of the book, uh, uh, this version is again completely different. The aim is completely different than these two other ones. You really, if you take the book, you is the small size of the book. It's not photo posh, but you can really look on the picture. You don't need to have a table. And what really I wanted to make the book, which is relatively cheap. I think 24 or 25 euros is a good price. So I wanted to give a chance to people who don't have much money to buy, to buy the book. Now this is very important because it actually goes back to my you know, early encounter with Helen Levitt when I met her when I was a student and we did this conversation with her and her cat. Uh, and and I kind of was a young curator and wanted to talk to her about the exhibitions. And it was really a great lesson because she said, actually, talk about photography. Um, she told me, you have to understand that books are much more important for me than exhibitions. Because I work on my books for many years. They are my artworks. She, you know, she was working on her last book at the time, made the layout. And it's so important in your work because you're, these are not just books about your work. These are works by you. W would you agree with... Helen Levitt, that books are more important than for, exhibition. For me, the, the exhibition is preparation for the book. You are testing certain sort of things. And uh, uh, for me, the, I think if photographer has something to say, he will make the book. And to come back to the, we'll talk more later about your other extraordinary books. Uh, and you've done so many amazing books. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about the gypsies, because when I ask you what drew you to, to this theme, you also talked about music, and it's interesting because Ming Smith before, uh, in the previous interview, talked a lot about music, and it's y your love for folk music was a trigger. Can you tell us about that and about music? Well, the first contact with the gypsies um, <coughs> was through the music. I, I love folk music, and I play uh, in one group, um, <coughs> violin and big pipes, and we used to go on these festivals, and, where, and there I met the gypsy music, and of course I fell in love in this music. Then I started to photograph the gypsies, and people ask me all the time how it happened that uh, 
I came to this idea to, to photograph gypsies. I never knew really what the reason was, but I only one thing I know very clearly is that once I stop, I didn't, uh, one, once I, I photograph, I couldn't stop. And, but again, it, uh, <coughs> it was sometimes the gypsy violin or, or some music which make me to start again. You can imagine if you see my pictures that, um, <coughs> that they might have been not all the time easy to make. So I love to photograph it, but it was not only easy, but I, again, I am saying for me, I stopped to photograph gypsies, and I wanted to say something generally about the human life. And another thing I wanted to ask you is about the cameras, because we spoke earlier today over lunch uh, about the extraordinary fact that you continue to make amazing work with photography. And many photographers I've you know, had conversations with actually stopped at a certain moment to be interested in photography. Cartier Bresson, when I had the conversation with him, uh, was mostly in the early to late 90s interested in, in his drawings and talked about, wanted to talk about his drawings. And it seems to have a lot to do with you permanently reinventing also new tools or working with new cameras and never repeat. And you, you said in an interview with um, actually Melissa Harris that the gypsies had a lot to do with the 25 millimeter wide angle lenses and that you would never have done this series without actually having this camera. Can you explain that a little bit to us and the importance also that you use different cameras for these different series? Well, first of all, first of all this question of the 25 millimeter is that with so 20, I got the first white angle lens which was made in East Germany, which came to Prague uh, by mistake. A uh, person who has got this camera, this lens, died, and his wife was selling everything, and she asked me if I want to buy that. I think all my gypsy work, and, and um, uh, partly 68 uh, invasion, a really period when I was widely using a 25 millimeter lens. I wanted to have, in most of the time when I was working with gypsies, there was a little room, crowded, and it was the only way how I could really work there. Um, Sometimes you can see that I was sitting probably on the table, that there are people around, and the person who I photograph is in the middle. <coughs> so uh, it was, for me, the, the most important thing. But as I usually, if you start use uh, <coughs> certain lens, and if you start to understand the lens, uh, then eventually you come to certain repetitions, yeah. So when I left Czechoslovakia, I stopped to photograph gypsies the way how I photograph in Prague, and I didn't need any more uh, this white 25 millimeter lens, and on the contrary, I want to, I want to learn to photograph with different camera, uh, because everybody was photographing with Leica, I took the Leica, and um, <coughs> I, um, uh, I think for me very important thing was that I discovered panoramic camera, yeah, because panoramic camera helped me to think more about what I am doing and develop. And I felt when I saw this camera, I was invited by the the the. <coughs> uh, it was French government who organized uh, several photographers to photograph contemporary um, <coughs> French landscape, and I didn't want to participate in it, but then I saw this panoramic camera, uh, so I said, can I, can I take it for one week? Um, they give it to me, I ran around, I was trying to photograph everything, and then I, when I uh, developed the film, I realized that 
there are certain potentials which maybe I should exploit. And I think it really helped me that I didn't stop, but that I went on the, on the other period. In fact, what, what is interesting, in, 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 what is interesting, that uh, <coughs> Prague 68, it was done in one week. Gypsies, 10 years. My panoramic work is already 30 years. And um, now I am closing certain period um, of my panoramic work for nearly 30 years. I photograph continuously photographing gypsy, uh, um, gypsies and people um, uh, work on the subject which I came to it again by chance. Um, <coughs> the Mediterranean and archaeological sites. So in six months, there is going to be a big exhibition here in Bibliothèque Nationale, uh, François Mitterrand, where I am showing a, a 40, three meters, three meters side of the photographs and <coughs> 80 smaller. And where I really, it is the result of my work. I was in every country, I was at least twice. The, the places that I went, some countries I went seven times. And I, uh, I feel that I get to the point now that I can't do it better. In fact, I did this year, my last trip, to three countries to photograph archaeological sites. And I, I said that it, it, was, it, it, uh, it was really for me, I made this trip to, to have the confirmation that I can't do it better and there is nothing else what, what I left. In fact, I was very lucky that in Jordani, Jordania, I make one picture which I, I feel that I justify my existence uh, in this year. I think the picture is not, not fantastic, but it is reasonably good, and it is a very good picture which I really needed. It's very beautiful now. Now you talked about um, the 10 years with the gypsies and we discussed that and you gave us wonderful explanations. We're gonna talk about the, the 30 years or more than 30 years of the panoramic work in a minute. But before that, I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about the week in, in Prague because I'm born in 68, so I've always been very interested in 68. And also it was amazing because when I, you know, I studied economy and ecology because I was very, um, interested in that theme, and that was a theme of my university studies. And uh, so that was with uh, a professor called Binswanger, who is a you know a visionary of bringing ecology into economy already in the 80s. And he had the office next uh, to Professor Ota Schick, uh, who of course was the economist of uh, the uh, 60A Prague. Uh, so uh, and told us always a lot about this. So I always wanted to hear from you more about Prague 60A because you. You told me that you weren't really informed at that time about photojournalism, that you did it for yourself, uh, and you did it very much in sync with, with the crowd. Can you tell us a little bit about that process, that extraordinary process? There were many photographers in that time in Prague, uh, but I think I was extremely lucky that one of the, one of the first on, on the place and um, in fact, most important pictures that really happened in one day, yeah. And I, why I think maybe that I made a better work than other photographers who were really reporters, that were reporters from all different countries, is that in spite of the fact I was not a reporter, I felt, <coughs> very strongly about what was happening. <coughs> it was my country, it was my problem. 
And I felt that when my girlfriend called me at four o'clock at night, that the Russians are there, and when I three times to put it down, and when she said, and the last time she said, open the window and you can hear uh, the flights. So I get out and it was very normal for me to get out and start to photograph. And what I did, I didn't think about anything else, just about photographing. There were the people who, um, there were the one Magnum photographer who, who <coughs> made the statement in the book about the Magnum that all these photographers, they were photographing in, uh, in the hiding and they were the one who went directly against the Russians. And he, that he thought he must be the, the either complete idiot or, <coughs> or very courageous man. I'm not a very courageous man, but you have to realize that it was exceptional situation which get something exceptional from all of us. And I think it is not only a case of me, if it would happen in your countries, you would behave the same way. And um, nobody in that period thought that I can photograph something like news, neither myself, I knew it. Finally, there are some people who are saying that this is one of the, the <coughs> good uh, reportage in the last century, yeah. Um, the, the label is not important for me, but I am very happy uh, that I work that way. I, one thing I must say that I, I must have been in the uh, dangerous situation, but I didn't feel them. I just, I went, I went. It was extraordinary time. Everything what happened to, could happen to me in the life happened in one week. I could have been killed, I fell in love, a <laughs> lot of things happened. And <clears throat> even that it was big tragedy, I am very happy that because I was there, I could photograph it. Yeah, thank you. And of course, this uh, then leads to your exile. It also leads to um, uh, actually um, uh, what we discussed earlier over lunch, your first uh, big exhibition. We talked about your first exhibition, uh, but your first really big exhibition, institutional exhibition, happened at the Hayward. Uh, can you tell us about that and about exiles? Um. I left Czechoslovakia and asked for exile in England, which I got. <coughs> um, strangely enough, uh, the Art Council, I think it was mainly because I have got the show in, in MoMA in that time, they gave me the space um, in the Haywood Gallery, in the ground floor, there were the Matisse drawings and sculpture, and they gave me all top floor. Um, <coughs> they, they were sure that nobody is going to come to my show, and that anyway, people are going to come to Matisse, which was quite sure, but finally I was told that on the contrary, in the end, there were really a lot of people who were going there just for my show. In that time, I, <coughs> the selection of the photographs, um, I was, for the show, I was making with Robert Del Pier. <coughs> and we were prepared, I, I have got a proposition to make the book for the exhibition. Del Pier makes the suggestion, uh, which I really didn't like, and I, refused to do this book. Uh, Del P was exceptionally man, but uh, <coughs> it was very sometimes difficult to change his opinion. Uh, in that time, I still didn't have much experience to look at my work and to think about the book. And so I suggest that Del P that we are going to make this little photo push with the mixture of everything which we did. 
Then two years, what was interesting on, on the Prague show, on the, on the London show, that for the first time, I accept uh, that I announce, uh, I put my signature on uh, my Prague 68 pictures. It was first time. The show was very important for me because I realize that people are, people are interested in my work and um, that I can do something the next time. So next time, <coughs> there was a show in Paris and Vizdal Pirvia again working on a new version of what he proposed me. And I like that. We put it together and Del Pier invented title Exil. I never, in my mind, was never uh, um, any idea that I'm going to make the book on the exile. I think probably it correspond, yeah. Uh, there were one, one thing was interesting, <coughs> which <coughs> there were one uh, American writer, uh, he talked um, uh, talk about Robert Frank and me. He said that we are completely different, but still there are certain similarities that we both left the, our country, but the principal difference is that Frank was criticizing and attacking, and I felt empathy and solidarity <coughs> with people which I photograph. It is interesting thing is that also, um, when I was in Prague, I saw uh, I saw the book of uh, uh, Frank, and I must say that it didn't impress me very much. It was not that I would know something about photography and that I would like to do something different. The, on the contrary, what impressed me very much, there were the little, <coughs> little catalog of the exhibition in MoMA, uh, which was on the Farm Security Administration. Again, I felt very strongly to these people who were on the pictures. It is not because the way how they were photographed. I didn't feel strongly about Americans where, which frag photograph. I never saw any American film. I didn't know anything about New York. I have never read any American literature. So. I didn't have any relationship to it. I think what was, what was, <clears throat> I think for me it is every time the subject is very important. And I photograph, let's take my, one of the last book on the wall between Israel and Palestine. Yeah. I got a proposition to participate on this project uh, which in the beginning I didn't know. Eventually, uh, after making four trips there just to see, I accepted it on the condition that I be photographing the wall and surrounding of the walls. By wall, by wall, because I grew up behind the wall. And the wall was my problem. And because <coughs> till I was 32, I, all my life, I was trying to go on this side, uh, on the other side. So, a uh, book which I did on, on the wall, Israel and Palestine, I took it as a, my problem. And I did it for that reason. Even that I really didn't like the wall at all. And most of the time, I really photograph only thing which I really like. And such a beautiful answer, and of course the extraordinary book you did on the wall um, was actually uh, prompted a, a poet friend of yours in Israel um, to say that you made the invisible visible. And uh, I think that's very fascinating because Paul Clay always said that that's what art can do, to make the invisible visible. Can you talk about that? No, I can't say much about it. <laughs> but do you agree? But do you agree with him? You know, um, I 
I think I think I hear it in Spanish. Lo visible hace la forma. What you see, it is made by form. Lo invisible le da su valer. What you don't see, it gives the form valer. Value, importance. Now before we talked about Robert Frank and when I met with Robert Frank, we talked a lot about, about cinema. And uh, in a way it had to do really what also Sheslav Milos, the poet from Krakow, whom I visited um, maybe, maybe 20 years ago, he said you know, that every art form, if it's, uh, if it's basically poetry or photography or painting uh, in the 20th century, and of course also 21st century, has somehow been impacted by, by cinema. And um, you said before that cinema didn't really have a big influence on you, but you said that you did actually see very early a film uh, in your village where you grew up when the Russians uh, liberated the village. Uh, and you also mentioned a certain interest in Italian neorealism. So whilst they understand that cinema wasn't a major influence on you, not as big as for Milos as for Robert Frank, it still would be interesting to hear about, about this. Definitely cinema didn't have any influence on me. Uh, I, if I see, no, if I go to cinema, uh, I don't go often to cinema. I don't have telev uh, television. I never have got in my life television. And I am... I don't have much patience, but if I look on the cinema, if there is the moment, I think, no, stop it. That's the frame. <laughs> now I feel a great responsibility you know, that we talk more about the 30 years, because we talked about the week, uh, and we talked about the 10 years, we talked about uh, Prague 68, invasion, we talked about the gypsies, but we have not yet really addressed, I have so far omitted to ask you more about the panorama. So it would be good uh, to maybe hear from you how this all began, because you alluded already before that it had to do with 86, with an, invent with an invitation actually um, uh, in France, which is anyway very rare for you, because you usually always reject invitations and you reject commissions. Uh, but after initially rejecting it, you actually accepted that invitation, and but then you realized actually that it led you to the north of France. Can you tell us about these beginnings of these, of these panoramic photos and uh, and how this now more than thirty year work began? Nineteen eighty six was important year uh, for me. <coughs> My daughter was born, one of my children, one of my three children was born. Who is actually here, we should give her a big <laughs> round of applause. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> I started use the panoramic camera and finally after 16 years, not having passport, I get a French passport. So, um, I... When I decided, when I said to these people who organized this project in France, photographing French landscape, they gave me <coughs> carte blanche so that I can go where I want. So I traveled around the France and I really, I realized that I am not interested in this beautiful French landscape and I can't photograph it. I love to be there, but doesn't interest me to photograph it. So, <clears throat> on the contrary, when I get on the north of France, where there, there were the big changes in the heavy industry, it was the place where I really started photograph. So, suddenly because of that, I get involved in the project, which lasts till now, uh, how contemporary men influence the landscape. So I made already about 13 books on the subject. <coughs> and um, I'm, uh, 
even the last project um, ruins it's part of the project but what is very what is very interesting for me is that in fact these are the only time that I photograph that something beautiful is coming out, that this is not destroying the landscape. Of course, if you touch the land, you destroy, but that archaeology really help us to discover something what was lost. And I really get involved um, in this project. Um, 16 years, I didn't have any place. Um, <coughs> I never pay any rent. Somebody said, um, I talked to somebody, I said, you know, I really feel well. He asked me why you photograph these things. I said, again, I don't know exactly, but I love to be in these places, and I feel well there. And he said, <coughs> maybe it is because you are exiled, because finally these places are becoming your home. And it's also, you want some water? It's also actually, very nice, the idea of the return, um, because you you told me that it's like two things, like you find these places and then you go back as many times as it takes to, to get it. Can you tell us about this idea also of returning to places? My last book, which I did, uh, I did it in Czechoslovakia for my bitter retrospective, but it was published also in English. It's called Returning. If I think about myself, photographer, uh, I have the idea that what makes me slightly different than the other photographers is that um, if I think about myself, I consider that, that I'm this little guy who walk around on this earth and trying to find the place where a picture is waiting for him. And when I find the place, I try to get this picture. I go there once, I go there 10 times, sometimes I get it, sometimes never. But this is my principle. For that reason, I think the project on the ruins is finished because I can't do it better. It was very similar in Israel. I made a seven trips to Israel every time, about three weeks. And then when the project finished, I pay my trip by myself. I went to go there. I went there again just to feel that I couldn't do it better. I think this is my, my rule with most of the thing which I do. You made <coughs> the dummy of the book. You have these thousand possibilities, but thing is, important thing is, finally to get the one, which is the only one which you think that it should that the book should be done. I remember the the book which title was printed. Um, it was twenty third of <coughs> uh, December at two o'clock at night. I was in Magnum, and I said, I got it. Now, the ruins uh, made me also think of paintings. I was, you know, thinking of Hubert Robert. And, of course, with Ming Smith, we discussed before that Ming has also this practice as a, as a painter. Um, you, you don't paint, but you were telling me before that you have often been inspired by by painting, that has a lot to do, you're interested in Renaissance painting, and I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. I think it is slightly different. Uh, people are saying that uh, there are similarities between Bresson and me, that we love the paintings. Bresson used to say about, he used to say about me that I have the painter's eye. Um, there's the big difference between Bresson and me. Bresson started with painting. I didn't start with painting. I, I, 
I, I started with the photography. I'm still a photographer, but I love paintings. And this is the first thing, whenever I come to Newton, I go to have a look to the galleries and to the museum. Uh, I love the painting. And can you tell us about the connection also uh, to the Renaissance? Because you were mentioning before that you have a particular interest in the Renaissance, and I found that very fascinating. Well, I never studied history of art. <coughs> and I was not particularly interested in Czechoslovakia, not interested in art. I think the changes are important. I left the Czechoslovakia, <laughs> and suddenly I went to Spain, and I started to look at the things slightly different way. Once I came to Granada, and there is this Capilla Real, uh, Los Reyes Católicos, uh, and there were the big collection of Flemish painting. And I really, I fell in love, yeah. And I thought that because I didn't know anything, I thought that Membling was the greatest painter, which of course he's not, he's a good painter, but <coughs> I started to be really interested in, in the painting. What you are saying, it is <coughs> slightly different that I go to these museums and because I never study art, in spite of the fact I come to the room and I screen the room. I say, that's one, that one, that one. I like that, I, what you talk about, and if you come to my studio, <coughs> there is the <coughs> Piero della Francesca flagellazione, which is really the structure. Is the anybody who photographs with 35 millimeter? Composition is the same for everybody. It, it, it is nothing special, yeah. And <coughs> so um, uh, we talk about that in this, paper which they are giving here for free, there is the little reprodu reproduction of the, uh, <coughs> of the Toulouse Lautrec, the, the, uh, is, the, uh, is the circle, there is the horse running from the right, and again it's wonderful painting, it's really <coughs> something like you would do with 25 millimeters. Yeah. So I, if you have a look on the Beckman, um, some of this landscape which he did, of course it is different. In fact, when we talk about it, I think there is a lot of bullshitting going all the time. And one of the things which I think was Comple is completely different in this story with the 50 millimeter and Cartier-Bresson, yeah. My feeling is that Bresson was a young man. He went around the shop and he saw the object which he liked. It was the camera. He didn't know anything about lenses. He bought the camera and if you look on all his early pictures, they were taken with white angle lens, and in fact, in that time, Leica came with white angle lens, 25 millimeters. You might know my picture, three gypsy musicians, violinists. If you have a look on the Bresson picture, two prostitutes in Mexico, the structure is the same. You had the subject here, you are standing here, and you have everything in the focus till the end. Have a look, have a look on these early pictures and you realize that they, many of them must have been there. Yeah, yeah. There's this vertical, horizontal picture, there's a man with the head coming like that from one side. It is not 50 millimeter lens. <laughs> yeah. So we return to these pictures, that is a wonderful idea, and, and look at them again and again. Now, what you just mentioned has to do, of course, with composition. We spoke about it before over lunch, a sort of a balance of the power. And you talked about flying also, and kind of we connected it to your beginnings also with engineering. Can you maybe 
Tell us about that connection, the composition. That's the not, since I was little, I wanted to work with the airplanes, which eventually I, I went to study engineering and I have been working with airplanes for seven years. And I love, I love uh, to work with the planes. What is very strange is that it was the period when I was taking picture, and there is no one picture of really of the planes. Yeah, I think this is similar, similar thing probably that I, I love ladies, but there is hardly ever any nude in between in my contact sheets. Yeah, so, <coughs> so what I wanted to say as regards the, uh, the studying, I think of course everything is connected. Yeah, and if you study engineering, uh, you study composition because the <coughs> balance uh, is really the composition. The airplane is flying because there is the composition. If if I am looking on the picture, I uh, I turn it around that I see more structure of the picture, and I see it's falling down on that side. Yeah. This is a, the same thing. So I think everything is connected, uh, and of course, one has something to do with the second one. A few very last questions. <coughs> one thing I wanted to ask you is about the digital age, because obviously uh, we live in the digital age, and you also started to use digital cameras. Uh, you actually said, there are good sides to that and bad sides to that uh, before over lunch. Can you tell us a little bit about what changed for you in the digital age? Well, I was, I <coughs> for my panoramic photography, I was using this Fuji 6x18, <coughs> which you have four frames on one film. Uh <coughs> usually, you need a lot of film. You need a lot of money for every day if you work, uh, which all the time was a big problem. Uh, most of my pictures, are, uh, mo of most, of, most of my books are uh, done on the landscape, and it is because uh, I got the support and I needed to make the book on what I did. Uh, I think that now let's put it this way. Once I've, I have been using the life, uh, the the labo, for a very long time. Probably thirty years, even more. Once I got a letter that they stop develop, developing on the films. Uh, so what I'm going to do? Yeah, I was extremely lucky because. <coughs> some of friend of mine has got good relation with the people. Uh, is Leica, and he brought me to Leica factory, and I was really impressed how precise and the perfect they were. Uh, I brought with me uh, the my camera, friend of mine who is sitting over there, uh, <coughs> um, said he needs something, what his picture look exactly the same way and um, which means the perspective focal lens is the same so the were the calling between finally they got <coughs> one lens um, then how to do panorama from this I said I really need to black this uh, it was standard camera they, uh, they said we can't do it because uh, everything we, 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 are we will mess up. So they made two lines. They gave me camera. Uh, they gave me this camera in the evening. I next day I went. I walk around. I took few pictures. We printed them, and I realized that it might work. So in three months, I received uh, <coughs> thanks to my friend. Uh, who know these people there, the cam panoramic camera, Leica panoramic camera, which was done only one example for me. 
<laughs> and again, it helped me to go ahead with my panoramic photography. Why? Because I didn't need any more to find the sponsors, and I didn't need to carry 35 kilograms around. Yeah. So I think that there are positive and there are negative things too. Of course, it is not enough, then you, uh, you have to get uh, quality of the print the same, like Tri-X or whatever you are using, but, but it is possible. Now, one thing when we talked about what we are losing on the negative side, you said something so fascinating before about meeting, because you said, you know, prior to the digital age, uh, before we were connected, um, or when it was more difficult to reach each other prior to mobile phones, you would just go to the Magnum, you know, place and Magnum office and meet other photographers and meet friends, and that that somehow had disappeared. C can you tell us about that? Because if I found that very fascinating. Well, I think it is not only typical for Magnum. Uh, I think it's. I don't think that really photographers need agency here. Yeah. They can do most of the work uh, by themselves and possibly uh, as the assistant. Yeah. So most of the photographers are doing it. Of course, uh, if you, what used to be wonderful, you came to photographer's room in the Magnum and there were the people working. You might not like all of them, but still you talk to them, you discuss. And, and it was exchange of the ideas and meeting the place. Now it's disappearing. And um, I think we have to accept it. Eh? And that's all. Yeah. Two very last questions. Um, I wanted to ask you about your unrealized project, uh, and you mentioned before that you have one unrealized project, which is to do a big exhibition of the panoramas. Well, soon I am going to be 82 years old. Uh, I met Bresson, and I am already 30 years old when I met him. And it was already in the period when he stopped taking photographs. I feel very privileged that I still like to take photographs. And if I don't take, I still think all the time about the photography. <coughs> and because 82 years old means that and you, if you work all your life, you don't want if somebody will mess it up completely. Yeah. So uh, you take care about it. Um, what I am doing now, uh, uh, and um, the the answer, the the, the and I, I made a rule in 1999. I stopped to sell photographs. I'm thinking about the traditional, not panorama. And I said, I don't want anymore. It was the period that I was making decent money in Magnum. I uh, could support my children, and I didn't want to have more. I love to say, I don't want to be the richest one in the cemetery. <coughs> and so I stopped to sell photographs, which means that I accumulate quite a number of the photographs. There were a lot of people in some countries which helped me. There were the England, England, they gave me passport, uh, they, not they didn't give me passport, but they gave me exile. They made a f my first big exhibition. Uh, there were the French who gave me passport, and I am French now and Czech too. And of course, I was born in Prague. And um, <coughs> there are also gypsies, which I owe something to them. So I am dividing now my work on these little boxes and giving them, placing them to the, to the places which I think they should go. Of course, 
For example, I have four gypsies, 60 photograph, beautiful one, but it wouldn't be a good idea now to put it in any gypsy museum which exists in, in uh, Europe because they wouldn't stay there for a long time. So <clears throat> my plan is to put it, in, uh, and I'm discussing already with Simon Museum, with Simon Europe, to keep it, to put it there for 20 years, then the committee decide is or if already exists, for example, museum on the European gypsies, safe place to to give it there. <coughs> I think you get and you have to give back. Very last question. Rainer Maria Rilke wrote this wonderful little book, which is an advice to a young poet, and I see many young photographers here. So I wanted to, to ask you what in uh, 2019 would be your advice to a, to a young photographer. Well, put it the simplest way is to buy good shoes, to walk, and have a eyes open. It should be enough. I'm hoping, hoping that you find something which you would feel strongly about and that you have to do it. Joseph, thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A big round of applause for Joseph Kudelka. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs>